I work for uh, a little company in Boulder called Cool Essence. Uh, we're a privately funded group. We've been doing cold fusion work for the last seven years. And we focus our work exclusively on experimental replication of work that has been published elsewhere. Um, as I get into this, I'll try to deconstruct this title a little bit. Um, charged particles are things like alpha particles, and they're evidence of cold fusion. That's why it's interesting to look for it. And I'll talk some about uh, co-deposition, which is a technique um, to initiate a cold fusion reaction. Um, let me start with a little bit of history. Um, before I got involved, this Time Magazine cover was kind of the beginning and end of my uh, understanding of the field. Uh, this was about the point where it was sort of made a big deal and then it kind of went away. People thought it was sort of uh, a hoax. Uh, it turns out there's a number of people, a couple hundred worldwide, that have been working on it um, since 1989. In 1989, Fleshman and Pons um, produced more heat than could be explained by known chemistry um, using a uh, palladium deuterium electrolytic cell. One of the questions the critics asked was, well, if this is really a nuclear reaction, there should be some nuclear byproducts uh, referred to by the cold fusion people as nuclear ash. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here is the look, looking for that nuclear ash, which in this particular case is charged particles. Uh, a charged particle being something like an alpha particle, a helium nucleus, or a proton, or an energetic deutron. deutron. Um, not long after, um, well, when, in 1989, when the field started, everybody tried everything to see if they could recreate this. Um, a group led by Stan Spock, uh, who worked for a naval group uh, out in San Diego, described a technique called co-deposition. Um, in the original Pons Flashman cell, uh, the way that worked is you had a palladium cathode in heavy water, and when you electrolyze the water, you pull hydrogen, or, or in this case deuterium, to the cathode and oxygen forms at the anode. Um, and when you do that, palladium is this magic material which absorbs lots of hydrogen or deuterium. Uh, and when you get uh, about one deuterium atom for every uh, palladium atom in the lattice, you get this reaction. It takes a long time for that to occur. So the breakthrough that Stan Spock described was a technique where you plate palladium out at the same time you electrolyze it, and so you, you build this one-to-one -one ratio right away. The reaction starts more quickly. Um, in 2007, from the same group, Pam Mosier Boss described uh, a technique to find charged particles using a solid-state detector called CR39, which I'll talk more about as we get into this. Um, so what I want to talk about is kind of the search that we did in our laboratory to reproduce the work that was described by this naval group. Um, we thought this was important work for a couple reasons. Um, a number of people described seeing similar things, so it was, seemed to be pretty reproducible. Um, charged particles were real interesting because they don't happen by accident. They have to happen as a result of a nuclear reaction. So we thought that was interesting. Um, and what I'm going to do and go through this talk is kind of chronologically what we did in our search and what we found. Um, we went into this trying to answer the question is, OK, these charged particles are there. What's the nature of them? When do they occur? What are their energies? What can we learn about them? All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, co-deposition. I've got a little cartoon over there. Um, so you take a little cell, you fill it full of an electrolyte. In this case, um, you, you need some sort of a salt in the electrolyte in order to make it conduct electricity. In this case, it's lithium chloride. Uh, and then there's also some, a small amount of palladium chloride. So when you pass a current through the cell, you do two things. You plate palladium out on the cathode, and you also evolve uh, deuterium from the uh, cathode and oxygen from the anode. Um, this protocol is relatively slow. It runs for a couple weeks, and then you turn the current up, and that's when interesting things happen. The whole experiment takes about three weeks. Um, we show here, and, and lots of other people in the literature show, these really interesting cauliflower-like um, palladium deposits. They have a lot of surface area and that's where the reaction is thought to occur. So in the first phase of our study, um, we said, gee, these charged particles exist. What can we do to get more information about them? Um, so we used a scintillation detector, and a scintillation detector is a crystal, or in some case, an organic material, that when you hit it with an energetic charged particle, it makes light. 
uh, and then you can collect the light and uh, figure out characteristics about when the particle arrived and how much energy it had. Um, radiation is a discrete event, so every time you get a decay, uh, you get a flash of light and you typically put a counter behind it. So we refer to counts as being a measure of the amount of radiation uh, that was measured. Um, this is kind of a cartoon of what the first experiment looked like. Uh, we've got this little electrolytic cell. Uh, we make the cathode by putting a thin film of metal onto the scintillation crystal. And then as you run the experiment, you plate the pla palladium out, which are those little irregular shaped blobs. And on the side of the palladium that faces the scintillation crystal, if a reaction occurs, you get a charged particle. It doesn't have very far to go. It goes into the scintillation crystal. It makes light and it gets detected. So in real life, it looked like this. Uh, these cells were about three inches tall. This is the cathode right here. It's the scintillation crystal with um, a metal film on it. The vertical wires over here were the anode. It was filled with this brown cocktail, uh, which was lithium chloride and palladium chloride and heavy water. Um, and then the back side of the scintillation crystal went up against a, a photomultiplier tube, which is a light detection device. And that whole device is sealed up in a dark chamber, and the experiment runs for about three weeks. What happened? Um, nothing. That was bad. Um, we didn't see any increase in counts, so we didn't see any charged particles above background. Um, the background was higher than we kind of wanted it to. We were seeing about 200 counts a day of background. Um, so it meant that if we got a lot of energy all at once, we certainly would see it. If we got particles counts that showed up uniformly over the two-week period, we probably wouldn't see it. Um, whenever you're doing a replication and you get a negative result, the first question you ask is, okay, did we run the right experiment? Did we create the right conditions? Or, did, or can we explain the negative result by the fact we didn't run the right experiment? Which led us to the second set of our experiment, which was to try to understand you know, why didn't the first one work? Um, in order to do that, we decided to run two cells at the same time. One of them, like the one I just described, and the second one, we were going to use the CR39 whoops, uh, detector that the, uh, the Navy group had used. So let me tell you a little bit about CR39 and how it works. Uh, on the right-hand side is a little piece of CR39. It's plastic. It's the same material your eyeglasses are made out of. In this case, it's made in really thin sheets and it's extremely pure, it doesn't have any holes in it. Uh, it has the characteristic that if you hit it with an energetic charged particle, the charged particle damages the plastic. Um, and then you, uh, after you've run your experiment, you develop it, if you will, by etching the material in a hot lye solution. And then you read it by looking at it with a microscope. Um, CR39 is an integrating detector. What that means is that any particle that hits it from the time it was born until you develop it get recorded. So you can detect very low levels of activity. The bad news is you have no idea when that activity occurred. Uh, in order to count it, um, you can do it by hand, and you do that for about two days, and you go nuts. Uh, we ended up building a, an automatic scanner, uh, which was a microscope on a three-axis stage. It just sort of ran across the uh, piece of CR39, taking two to 4,000 images, and then we uh, crunched those images with some computer programs. And it results in uh, little montages of tracks. So this is what a radiation track looks like. Those little squares represent about 50 microns of distance on a piece of CR39 plastic. So this is the cartoon of what the um, CR39 experiment looks like. Um, similar to the other experiment, we had a, um, a wire, which is a cathode, uh, a piece of the CR39 plastic, which is inside the cell with the electrolyte. Again, the palladium forms on the wire. If the reaction occurs on the CR39 side, charged particles hit the CR39 and make tracks. In real life, it looked like this. Um, the top picture is the cell with the scintillation crystal, which is that round disk. Uh, the cathode wires ran horizontally, and then behind it, you can't really see the anode wires ran vertically. Uh, and the lower picture is the same thing with the CR39. So we ran those two cells at the same time. This is interesting. We saw some good stuff here. Um, and curious, we didn't see anything on the scintillation counter. But on the CR39, we saw all sorts of good stuff. Um, 
this picture here is what the physical part looked like when we brought it out. So there was physical evidence. You could see where the lines were. And if I blew those up with a microscope, I see all sorts of tracks here. And this representation on the right side is the spatial track density. So in the area where the cathode is, you've got the elevated counts. Uh, what's interesting here is the number of counts was well larger than our background. So if those counts represented charged particles, we should have seen something on our scintillation counter, um, which begged the question, why not? Um, which brought us into the third phase of the experiment, which was, OK, we see counts on the CR39. Uh, how come we didn't see counts on the scintillation counter? One of the criticisms that was mounted in the, um, uh, the field of this experiment was CR39 is traditionally used in high energy physics experiments in a vacuum chamber, which is pristine and clean. Um, there was some criticism that putting CR39 into the electrolyte might allow the electrolyte to damage the CR39 and make fake tracks, if you will. Uh, so the Navy group um, came up with an experiment where they protected the CR39 with mylar. Um, and we set out to reproduce that experiment exactly. Um, I, I might make a note that one of the Leonard researchers lectures us about constantly, and that is, if you're going to reproduce somebody's experiment, reproduce their experiment. Don't make it better. So what we did here was exactly the opposite. We made it better, and then about a year later, we finally got to doing what we should have done at first. But this is what we did. OK, so this is a cartoon of the Mylar protected CR39. Uh, we cut a hole in the cell, this little plastic box, and we covered that hole with a mylar window. Uh, the mylar was very thin so that the uh, charged particles could pass through it without any problem. Uh, and then the CR39 was on the outside of the window, not in, the, in contact with the electrolyte. So again, if a reaction occurs on the mylar side of the uh, little palladium deposit, the charged particle is generated, passes through the, uh, through the mylar window, hits the CR39, and makes a track. In real life, it looked like this. Um, the mylar window was six microns. To put that in perspective, a piece of paper is about 10 times that size. It's about 50 to 100 microns. So this is really thin. Um, the cathode wire is pressed up against the CR39 and then up against the, uh, up against the mylar, then the CR39. The charged particles pass through with very little attenu attenuation. In addition to the CR39, we also monitored some chemical characteristics of the cell. We monitored its voltage and the pH and some things like that to get a better idea of what might be going on inside these cells. What do we see? Um, well, in all the cells that we ran with deuterium, um, we saw a significant increase in tracks in the area of the cathode. And here you can see, you know, this is what the tracks look like in the microscope. And they showed up here in the area of the cathode. What did that mean? Um, we looked at the tracks, and we observed, as, as others had observed before us, that the tracks produced by the, uh, the electrolytic co-deposition process didn't look like tracks we got from calibration. Um, in the lower set, these tracks were produced by taking a known uh, 5 MeV alpha emitter, which was polonium-210, and exposing that to the CR39 and then going through the development process. And you get these really round or elliptical shaped um, distinct tracks. Uh, the shape is a function of the angle that the particle hits the CR39 with. It hits dead on. They're, uh, they're round, otherwise they're a little elliptical. And up here, we saw tracks that look very different, uh, which raised the question, OK, what, what maybe made those? Um, the other thing we noted, um, you know, these cells run for three weeks, and the cells, particularly after uh, electrolysis in a heavy water environment, were clearly damaged. The other thing we noted is in every case where we have elevated tracks, the area where the tracks were elevated, we saw something on the CR39. We saw stuff like this, you know, the micrograph of the little blow up, look, you know, lots and lots of activity, which corresponded to regions that had. Uh, high counts. Um, if you take CR39 and put it in a vacuum chamber and expose it to a radioactive source, you don't see anything to the naked eye. You see it in the microscope, but not to the naked eye. So 
that made us a little suspicious that maybe something else was going on. Um, I'm not going to say much about this other than there was significant evidence from our uh, measurement of pH and cell voltage and stuff like that that there's a lot of chemistry going on inside the cell. The pH goes from kind of uh, acidic to real acidic up to very basic. Um, and there was also a period where we were making hypochlorite ions, which is uh, basically bleach. Um, so that, that made us ask, is there any way that the chemistry in the cell is damaging the, uh, the CR39? Uh, one of our colleagues at the Naval Research Lab suggested, well, why don't you put some aluminum foil on it? Aluminum is pretty easily attacked by chlorine. Uh, we did that in two different ways. Uh, we put some strips of aluminum on, and we also, after we had built one of these cells, we had uh, a thin, thin film of, my, uh, of aluminum put on the mylar. She can, oops, as you can see here, it was pretty much destroyed, and we had evidence of damage here. The final experiment we did was we introduced a small air gap, a half a millimeter air gap, uh, which is not enough to significantly uh, lower the energy of charged particles. And what we saw was in the case where we didn't have an air gap, we had elevated counts. In the cases where we did have air gaps, the counts went away. So in summary, we never saw counts on the scintillator. Um, we saw tracks even in the mylar protected CR39 cell as well as the cells without the mylar. The tracks looked different from normal alpha tracks. The track location correlated well with damages. Mylar didn't prevent damage to the foil. And if we put an air gap in, the tracks all went away. So we concluded, unfortunately, not what we wanted to find when we set out. Uh, we concluded that the likely cause of the CR39 tracks was chemical damage, not nuclear activity. Um, and in all the runs we did in our lab over an 18-month period, we don't think um, we saw any evidence of uh, charged particles. And, and one of the lessons that we took away from this was it's important not to give up when you get the results you're looking for. You really need to dig in and see if there's anything else that might be explaining what you've got. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Kendall, thank you very much. We can have questions now. I actually just wanted to applaud your closing statement. I overheard a conversation with another attendee at this meeting saying that in any study, she was always most suspicious when she got the results she expected. All right. Um, very crude, loose uh, replication that got the same results as you. I did uh, one run sort of as a slap together duct tape hobbyist, or um, no, two runs. One with the CR39 um, right on the electrolyte, fills with millions of pits. Uh, got hold of some very thin mylar, put the mylar in the way, um, couldn't see any pits, but then I didn't get the damage to the mylar you saw. So yeah, it looks like it's all an artifact of chemistry. Thank you. 